Hello and welcome to Capital Journal. I'm Jeff Sanders filling in for Todd Stacy. Thanks so much for being with us. Leading off our news this week, new developments and the ongoing tensions involving the Alabama Department of Veterans Affairs and Governor Kay Ivey. After months of discord between Commissioner Kent Davis, the governor and the Department of Mental Health, Davis had initially agreed to resign by year's end. But after a heated ADVA board meeting this week, the governor stepped in and fired Davis. Randy Scott has more on this week's top story. Hereby call the special call meeting of the State Board of Veterans Affairs into order. The State Department of Veterans Affairs is in a special meeting to decide the fate of Commissioner Kent Davis. Governor Kay Ivey called the meeting for agency members to vote on her request to have Davis removed from his post. Board members have concerns. A lack of trust, bias, assumptions, misunderstandings. Today we will deal with facts. The board has been trying to remain neutral in order to come to the objective conclusions. It's been hard. With so much external pressure and noise, media opinions, omissions of facts, myth truths, and assumptions. If your vote on this resolution in any way hinges on the outcome of specific questions, let me respectfully suggest that we are missing the forest for the trees. To adopt the resolution before you today, you need to agree with only one, just one ground identified by Governor Ivey. I have had and I have every intention of honoring my agreement that was entered into with the governor's office on September 9th. <clears throat> and I don't believe I've done anything to abrogate that agreement. The discussion covers projects and working relationships with other agencies. We had a memorandum of agreement with the Alabama Department of Mental Health who was providing technical assistance for the grant administration. We were paying mental health to administer the grants. We had transferred the $7 million to the Department of Mental Health. When they expressed a concern, I believe Beverly Williams, then Beverly Gephardt said, hey, we've got some issues that we've talked to mental health about with some of the grant recipients, but we should be able to work that out in the contract process. The motion failed with three no's and two in favor, two abstentions. Commissioner Davis and some veterans react after the meeting. The commissioner is not the issue here. We have inadvertently stepped in to somebody else's turf. This is the Alabama Department of Mental Health Care. The mental health care monopoly in this state is trying to snuff out any veteran-led efforts to provide mental health care treatment for veterans. For the next two months, I will continue to put in about 60 hours a week in the performance of my jobs because I do a lot of time to help the veterans in the state. That's not a brag. It's just a passion that I have taking care of those veterans. In Montgomery, Randy Scott, Capital Journal. So how did things escalate to the point where Governor Ivey decided to fire Commissioner Kent Davis this week? Let's take a look at the timeline. In August of 2023, the Alabama Department of Veterans Affairs received an additional $2 million in American Rescue Plan Act funding for mental health care, boosting the total to $7 million. By January 2024, a committee comprised of officials from both the ADVA and the Alabama Department of Mental Health began reviewing grant applications. They selected 33 recipients. However, in April of 2024, the partnership between the Department of Mental Health and the ADVA came to an end. Commissioner Kim Boswell cited concerns that the grants might not comply with federal ARPA guidelines. As tensions rose, Commissioner Davis filed an ethics complaint against Commissioner Boswell, but the Ethics Commission dismissed the complaint. In September of this year, Governor Kay Ivey issued a letter urging Davis to resign, citing what she described as ample calls and allegations of mishandling the grants. Davis refused. On September 9th, Davis met with the governor's team and agreed to resign by the end of the year. On October 10th, the State Board of Veterans Affairs voted to request that Davis reconsider his resignation, a motion passed after Governor Ivey had already exited the meeting. Yet the situation continued to unfold when the governor called for a meeting on October 18th to seek Davis's immediate removal. Finally, this week, October 22nd, the board voted against the governor's removal request. That's when the governor issued an executive order terminating Davis. 
Meanwhile, the newly formed Veterans Mental Health Steering Committee is moving forward on plans to increase accessibility for traumatic brain injury screenings for veterans across Alabama. With brain injuries identified as a major factor in veteran mental health challenges, the committee, led by Alabama Department of Mental Health Commissioner Kim Boswell, sees screening expansion as a priority. On Wednesday, the committee received a detailed briefing on the widespread prevalence of TBIs among veterans and their significant impacts on mental health. We're beginning to work through a plan that was laid out in the legislation and really trying to move forward with looking at what services are currently available to veterans. Uh, you heard a very important conversation about traumatic brain injury and screening for traumatic brain injury. Uh, because we know veterans who have a substance use issue and a traumatic brain injury are at greatest risk of suicide. Uh, so one of my big things is going to be we need to be screening for brain injury everywhere there is a veteran. Uh, we need to be doing that for everybody in our mental health programs and our substance use programs too. You heard a lot about that. Uh, and then I think getting information out was sort of another running theme today. Um, I would love to see 988, you know, publicized on every website that touches veterans. We covered some areas I had not heard before. It was very educational for me. And the fact that traumatic brain injuries are so pervasive throughout our population, not just with, with veterans, and the significance in terms of uh, mental health that it carries for the whole state of Alabama, I was certainly impressed by that, and, and that was new to me. There's been a surge in violence for Alabama prisons. That's according to a recent report from the Alabama Department of Corrections. There were 916 total instances of fighting among inmates from October of 2023, the beginning of the most recent fiscal year, to August 31st, representing a roughly 13% increase when compared to the same period last year, which saw 811 documented fights. Instances of inmate assaults on prison staff had also increased with 479 cases as of August 31st, up from 453. As of August 31st, Alabama's incarcerated population was 27,428, up from 26,947 last year. Tension continues between Alabama lawmakers and the Board of Pardons and Paroles over its handling of parole guidelines. Board Chair Lee Gwathney appeared before the Joint Prison Oversight Committee Wednesday where lawmakers expressed frustration with the board's low rate of compliance with its own rules and lack of updates to those guidelines, requirements the board is legally bound to follow. Under Gwathney's leadership since 2019, the parole grant rate in Alabama has plummeted from over 50 percent to just 8 percent last year. This decline is drawing increased scrutiny as lawmakers question why the board is following guidelines in only 25 percent of cases. The committee is now giving the board until November to respond to outstanding questions, hoping for solutions that address both transparency and the state's parole rate. I thought yes. you were asking me who wrote these, and I can tell you the names, and I can tell you that Council of State Government was very active in the development of these. I, I, can, I can tell you all of that. So that's why I'm... I'm struggling right now to know how you want me to answer that question. It's not that I'm evading your question, Chairman. Jim, um, and, Emily, I, and that's knowing, why I don't want you to feel that I was evading your question in any knowing any, what Knowing what I know now, the answer to the question is staff at the bar, board of uh, at the, the bureau, bureau at the bureau. pardons and paroles develop this information. Yes. They review it with us. We have a public comment period, and we, as the board, adopt the, guide, the parole guidelines. That, that's the answer. I want you to imagine creating a process that you're supposed to follow so you can tell people if it works or not, and then you're changing it. So how are we, as legislators who pass a law, right, to put it in place and then expect government agencies and those who work there to follow it or at least implement it who come to you five years later and tell you they haven't done it yet and don't even know why. So, again, as you asked, if we're talking about guidelines being changed, score seats being changed, or not being followed at all, how do you as a citizen have any faith in that process? But as us, as a legislature, 
how do we have any faith that you can faithfully execute that responsibility to keep us safe? Some Alabama lawmakers are calling for an investigation by the Attorney General into possible illegal activities surrounding the mismanagement of a state occupational board. Concerns have been raised regarding Smith Warren Management's oversight of various licensure boards, especially after a recent audit of the Alabama Board of Electrical Contractors revealed significant financial discrepancies. Lawmakers learned that Smith Warren billed for unauthorized personnel and failed to document nearly $100,000 in receipts. Representative Matt Simpson highlighted the seriousness of the situation, suggesting potential theft, fraud, or ethics violations may have occurred. What we found was in addition to their $510,000 that they were charging the Electrical Contractors Board, they came back and were also charging for more services and doing involving investigations. They paid a personnel cost totaling $30,000 for another investigation investigator, a personnel cost for a policy director slash state government liaison in the amount of $44,000. So this is a, t and they had some uh, employee benefits included in that as well. So. To a grand total, they were also getting $82,261.96 on top of $510 that they were getting. They also purchased a Tahoe without letting the board know that they were using a Tahoe. And then their investigators were getting mileage back as reimbursement from the board for mileage that they had. So when you have a vehicle, you're not supposed to get mileage for the vehicle if you're using a board vehicle. It's just a lot of potential double, double dipping that went on through this process. Alabama lawmakers are set to receive a 4.2% pay raise next year, increasing their annual salaries to $62,212, according to the Alabama State Personnel Department. The raise is tied to the state's median household income, a system that was implemented in 2012 through a voter-approved amendment. That amendment initially cut pay for many lawmakers, setting their salary at just under $43,000 in 2015. Since then, legislators have seen increases nearly every year. While lawmakers' salaries have grown by nearly $20,000 since 2015, it's less than they would have earned under the old pay structure. Analysts say that would be making about $69,000 for a lawmaker in 2024 if the original system had stayed in place. Thousands of Alabama residents who were mistakenly labeled as inactive voters have received letters confirming their eligibility to vote in the upcoming November election. This follows a court order by U.S. District Judge Anna Manasco, which halted a voter purge initiated by Alabama's Republican Secretary of State, Wes Allen. The purge program, which started in August, aimed to remove non-citizens from the state's voter rolls, but affected over 3,200 registered voters two-thirds of whom were legally registered. After the court's intervention, Allen directed county registrars to send letters to the reactivated voters, assuring them of their eligibility and they would not face any criminal charges. Speaking of elections, Monday marked the deadline for voter registration ahead of Alabama's upcoming general election. For those planning to vote absentee, the Secretary of State's office reminds voters that mail-in applications must be received by county absentee election managers by Tuesday, October 29th. If you plan to submit your application in person, the deadline is Thursday, October 31st. For returning absentee ballots in person, they must be submitted by the close of business on November 4th, the day before the election. Mail-in absentee ballots must arrive by noon on Election Day, November 5th. Governor Kay Ivey was on the road Monday as part of her Rebuild Alabama Road Tour to showcase progress under the Rebuild Alabama Act. The governor marked the latest round of road bridge projects, including a resurfacing project in the town of Ariton, that's in Dale County. Since the Rebuild Alabama Act was passed back in 2019 by state lawmakers, the state has undertaken several hundred road projects across the state. The Ariton project includes resurfacing nearly five miles of Creole Richardson Street, Pea River Road, and Atlantic Road funded through the Alabama Department of Transportation's annual grant program. When I took office in 2017, improving infrastructure was a top priority for us. At that time, we had not increased our investment in infrastructure in 30 years. That had to change. So we came together and passed the Rebuild Alabama Act with good bipartisan support. 
And I pledge that every single penny would go to road and bridge projects as well as to our port. And I promise that we would put those dollars into needed projects all across the state. Thanks to the Rebuild Alabama, we have embarked on more than 350 road projects in all 67 counties. Yo, know, that's no small feat. Governor Kay Ivey also announced this week over $7.2 million in new funding through the Growing Alabama program aimed at enhancing industrial and agricultural sites in four key areas across the state. This funding will support site development in Conecuh, Lauderdale, St. Clair, and Elmore counties, boosting site readiness to attract new industries and business expansions. Governor Ivey says the investments will help create jobs and strengthen local economies. Funding is set to include $3.8 million for industrial infrastructure in St. Clair County, $1.5 million for an agricultural center in Lauderdale County, $1.2 million for industrial site development in Conecuh County, and $792,000 for industrial park improvements in Tallahassee. The Growing Alabama program, managed by the Department of Commerce, provides tax credits for economic development, with Commerce Secretary Alec McNair calling it a key tool for spurring long-term growth and attracting new industries to the state. A new development in Alabama's medical marijuana dispute as a judge has appointed a mediator to help resolve the ongoing legal fight over who gets licenses to grow and sell medical cannabis. Montgomery Circuit Judge James Anderson appointed retired Circuit Judge Eugene Reese as the mediator in the case. Although lawmakers approved medical marijuana in 2021 for certain conditions, the program remains stalled due to legal challenges. Several companies that were denied licenses have accused the Alabama Medical Cannabis Commission of breaking state laws and rules during the selection process. The Alabama Medical Cannabis Commission has tried to issue licenses three times, but each attempt has faced legal challenges. A new bill in Alabama aims to protect students transferring between schools by ensuring their records are not withheld due to unpaid fees. Representative Matt Simpson, a Republican from Daphne, has pre-filed legislation addressing the issue. Simpson said Daphne High School principal Fletcher Comer contacted him about problems getting students records when they transfer from a private school to a public school. Comer highlighted challenges with receiving students records when they transfer from those schools. Now, some private schools have refused to release transcripts if the student owes money, preventing public schools from confirming whether or not the student has enough credits to graduate. Simpson says this has caused a ripple effect impacting graduation rates and school ratings. The proposed legislation would prevent any K-12 school, public or private, from withholding a student's record solely because of an unpaid balance. Public schools require these records to ensure students meet graduation requirements. Coming up after the break, longtime political analyst Steve Flowers joins us with his take on this week's drama involving the Alabama Department of Veterans Affairs and his insights on the final stretch to the general election. Later, Representative Ed Oliver discusses his proposed legislation to help retain more doctors in rural Alabama, followed by a visit from State Health Officer Dr. Scott Harris. Stay tuned to Capital Journal here on Alabama Public Television. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online at video.aptv.org. Capital Journal episodes are also available on APTV's free mobile app. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. And you can listen to past episodes of Capital Journal when you're driving or on the go with Capital Journal Podcasts. And welcome back. I'm joined now by political analyst Steve Flowers. We have a lot to talk about from the state to national politics and everything in between. Steve, as always, great to have you on the show. Thank you for having me, Jeff. Uh, let's start here in Alabama on the news that topped our broadcast uh, this week, and that's the uh, Veterans Board in the state. Uh, Kent Davis, uh, <laughs> we talked about it earlier, but, uh, but basically to break it down, as we said earlier, they had filed an ethics complaint against uh, Kim Boswell and, and, and some interagency disputes there. 
It got leaked to the press. The governor didn't like it. She wanted him to resign. He says he wasn't. They came together, said he would leave at the end of the year, and then the Veterans Board voted to not have him do it. They meet again this week because the governor had a special meeting to fire him. They still didn't fire him, and right after the meeting, the governor says, fine, I'll use my executive authority, and she terminated him. Now, the question is, is that legal? We know some governors have done it before. What's going on here, Steve? Well, first of all, I'm not saying that Veterans Affairs is not the most important cabinet member, but it's not. <laughs> I mean, in Alabama, people don't realize that most of the Veterans Affairs stuff is handled on the federal level. So a uh, congressman like Mike Rogers would have more influence over Veterans Affairs because that's a federal issue. You know, when I was in the legislature, we didn't have a Veterans Affairs office. So it's a minor uh, cabinet post, if you will. Nobody knows who's in it. Nobody cares who's in it. It doesn't have a lot of influence. Uh, but my observation is Kay Ivey is pretty loyal to her, her cabinet members, people she's selected. And a lot of them stay with her a long time. Uh, that she, she's, she's not someone you want to cross. And if she didn't think she had so, something he had done wrong, uh, I don't think she'd have moved like she did. I talked to someone high inside state government, not a, not a legislator, but someone who works kind of near, not a cabinet level position, but pretty close. And, 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 and their response to me was, why would you ever want to pick a fight with the governor? Exactly. It makes she, no sense. She's not one you want to pick a fight with. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's, she's laid back, but she's, she doesn't forget things. <laughs> she gets even. Well, we'll see what happens <laughs> with that. Obviously, there's thoughts of uh, they can challenge it in court. It would be interesting to see, uh, if, if, you know, if the, could they depose the governor in court? We'll see. And, uh, My guess is she'll prevail. Yes, probably so. All right, let's move on to... Uh, uh, politics, a little bigger scale, and that is, you, know, you may have heard, we have a big election coming <laughs> up here in about a week and a half. Uh, we'll talk about the national race in a second for president, but let's drop down to Alabama. Alabama is, is going to go Trump. We, all, we know that, uh, whether it's by margin A or margin B, it's going to happen. But that District 2 race between Caroline Dobson and Shamari figures, uh, Dobson, the, the Republican figures, the Democrat, that newly drawn district coming out of federal court that covers all of South Alabama. Your thoughts on that race and where do you see it leaning at this point? Well, going back to the original preface, uh, the presidential race is pretty much in the bag. I mean, not, not the result, but Strangely, there's only about seven states that really matter, and we're not one of them. I've often said in my columns and commentary that if Mickey Mouse were the Republican nominee, he'd carry Alabama. <laughs> By the same token, if Donald Duck were the Democratic nominee, he'd carry California. Yes. So as soon as the polls are closed Tuesday night week, uh, then you'll see the, the states covered with those seven states being decided, and we'll watch those all night. But having said that, we are a Republican state, but as you know, that that district was drawn by the federal courts to create a Democratic district. Uh, and it, it is pretty much a Democratic district. Uh, the reason I say that is that uh, the, when the courts, when the plaintiffs filed their suit, the federal court was intending to make it a Democratic district. That was their intention. And they asked the plaintiffs to sub submit a, uh, a t affidavit that showed what would be the results in, in this race if you had 16 elections? Well, they showed, the plaintiffs showed in 15 out of 16 elections where there was a contested mm -hmm. race, like a presidential race, that the Democrat would have won. Now, had Biden stayed on top of the ticket, I don't think the Democratic base, which is primarily folk, uh, females, African-American females, uh, they would not have turned out for Biden like they are for Miss Harris. Uh, and so, therefore, that race is really dictated by the top of the ticket. Uh, and turnout, of course. I think turnout. That's the key. That, that's the key. I think that if the Democratic voters turn out, that it favors the Democrat Shamari figures. Uh, if the, if the, they do not, it favors Carolyn and Dobson. And let me say this. My column this week, and I highlight this, the voters must have uh, subconsciously known they wanted a young candidate. And that's the right thing to have done. The in seniority system is so important in Washington, as you know, Jeff, that uh, you need a young person to get up there. Both those folks are in their 30s. Mm -hmm. And they both are well qualified. They're extremely well qualified. Uh, and I call them, I call them two thoroughbreds. So the Democratic and Republican parties selected the two best candidates that they could have picked in those primaries 
Shamari Figures is in his 30s. He has a Democratic pedigree a mile long. His father, Michael Figures, was a state senator for 18 years, was president pro tem of the Senate. Uh, Vivian has been the most, one of the most outstanding senators the last two or three decades from Mobile, or his mother, who took Michael's seat from Mobile. And uh, he's worked in Washington with the Obama administration, the Biden administration, and uh, he knows Democratic politics. Uh, Caroline, I have not seen a better candidate in my last three or four years of following than that young lady. She is the hat, she exudes class, integrity, mm -hmm. and she has worked so hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's raised her own money. I thought the Republican Party nasty would spend a lot more money in that race than they have, but she's had to raise her own money. She's and she worked. really beat some established Republicans in this state to get that, oh, to get God. that nomination. No, nobody gave her a chance. She beat Dick Brubaker, an established state senator, uh, former state senator. By 50, a long shot. 60-40. <laughs> yeah. 60-40 primary. She's worked hard. She's been helped a lot by Alpha in that district. And, uh, and she, but she's been, she's worked a hard campaign. And uh, you can tell she's left no leaf unturned. Well, we'll see how that turns out. It could be kind of be, a, you know, maybe it could shed a little light in, on turnout for the rest of the nation. Speaking of the rest of the nation, let's talk about uh, the presidential race. As we said, that is happening in about a week and a half, if you haven't heard. Harris versus Trump. And you mentioned the the, uh, the seven states, those swing states that seem to uh, define the election every election cycle. Uh, most polling, as when we're recording this show, has that neck and neck, maybe Harris up a point here or Trump a point there. Um, polls have been wrong before. They were famously wrong in 2016. I mean, what what's your gauge on this as we're about a week and a half out? I think it's the seven states. I think the 43 states, Hayes and the barn, uh, we're one of them. Uh, it's just a matter of whether Trump gets 63 or 64 percent here. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is the seven states of Georgia, North Carolina in the south, Arizona and Nevada in the west, and uh, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan in the midwest. Uh, I think from reading the polling I've seen and the trending that is happening in, uh, in polling and the uh, backup polls shows that I think Trump may carry Georgia and North Carolina. I think those two southern states come home to the Republican Party. Uh, the Republican legislature in Georgia cleaned up a lot of that loophole stuff they were doing in Georgia last time four years ago, and it's going to pay dividends in Georgia this time. I think Arizona goes Republican because of um, the immigration issue. They've been hit with it there, yeah. obviously, and so they, they, they want to end that situation. Now, ironically, Jeff, in that situation, that Senate candidate there is a lightning rod, Karen Lake, whatever her first name, I forget, but Lake. The oh, Carrie Lake, yes. Yeah, she, she's hurting Trump in Arizona. Conversely, where the top of the ticket usually makes a difference, she's hurting him in Arizona. Former news anchor. <laughs> I think she yeah. still gets, I think he still gets Arizona. Nevada doesn't matter because it's only four electoral votes, I don't think. It's, it boils down to uh, But then you get up into Pennsylvania and, That's and, where it's and Midwestern hell. swing states. I think it's Michigan and Wisconsin. I'd seen a national pollster, you and I talked about this <laughs> off camera, a pretty prominent national pollster, and he had made this comment that um, the most likely scenario to him is that uh, Harris carries all seven swing states. The second most likely scenario is Trump does. The point of that story is normally, well, maybe uh, one candidate carries these two and these two and this one. But his point was that it's such a tight race. It's, we're not sure about the polls that it's really anybody's race. I think it is so tight that even the weather that day can make a difference. I really think it's down to those three states, Pennsylvania, Michigan and Wisconsin, and I would really lean to, I really think Pennsylvania goes Democratic. I think that Philadelphia, they have spent a lot of money and effort in Philadelphia, the Kamala Harris campaign has, and I think it will depend on Detroit, whether they get the voters to the polls in Detroit or not, may make a difference in Michigan. It's gonna be that thin. And will we have an October surprise? I, well, I think that Nothing surprises you what Trump does. So you can't, you know, nothing, nobody's surprised by what Trump does, so he can't make a surprise. So I think when you do see a poll that shows it's 50 50, they're accurate, but who gets their folks to the polls is the key to it. We will find out. Uh, let's In those back. states. Yeah. Well, let's go back to Alabama quickly. 2026, uh, you mentioned Governor Kay Ivey earlier. She will not be running for re-election. Uh, it, you were telling me you get asked that question more than anything else. Who's going to be our next governor? 
that's been the most surprising thing to me. I've been on a speaking tour this fall, as you might expect. I've spoken to 30 clubs, probably 15 Rotary clubs around the state, from Mobile to Birmingham Rotary to Albertville and Scottsboro even. Uh, it's in every one of those clubs, I will talk about the presidential race and even the best Davy Chamber of Commerce the other day. Uh, and I, I opened it for questions, and I thought, well, they'll, I'll get a question about who's going to carry Wisconsin or Michigan or whatever. The first question I asked, and I met half those clubs, Steve, who's running for governor mm -hmm. in 2026? Who's going to be our next governor? Uh, people love the governor's race in Alabama. Uh, and I say the three obvious ones who've got to go somewhere are Lieutenant Governor Will Ainsworth, who's term limited, uh, Steve Marshall, the Attorney General's term limited, and Rick Pate, the Agriculture Commissioner. They've got to go somewhere. And they're three of the best known people, so people think they're obvious choices. Now, the one thing that this election, two weeks from now, November 5th, the presidential election, will make a tremendous difference in our gubernatorial race for this reason. The wild card in this whole governor's race is Tommy Tuberville. Coach Tuberville's Senate seat's up for election in the same year, 2026, as the governor's race. Uh, some people think he's tiring of the Senate. Uh, he got there at a late age. He's 70 years old. He's a backbencher. Uh, he may be worn out with being in the Senate. Plus, you add this caveat to it. Here's the caveat. People don't realize this, but Tommy Tuberville is Trump's closest friend in the United States Senate. They love each other. Mm -hmm. Tuberville plays golf with Trump all the time in Mar-a-Lago. So there's a possible cabinet position. I think he may take a cabinet position. or be, I think he'd be offered one. I think Trump thinks that much of him. But my advice to Tuberville is I'd stay in the Senate. You can do more for Trump in the Senate than you can as a cabinet member. Ask Jeff Sessions that question. He would probably exactly. agree with you there. Exactly. But, 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 to, but to put a bow on that, if, he do, if Trump wins and, and Tuberville is given a cabinet position or appointed to it and approved by the Senate, uh, then, then that opens up, you know, what, would Marshall or Ainsworth or whoever run for the Senate as opposed to running for governor. Mm -hmm. And don't forget John Merrill's out there. And I just say this because I see John Merrill so active uh, on social media, and you're talking about speaking tours. He's traveling the state left and right, so I, I, we'll see. My what happens. guess is Merrill. The, the the best race in the state is going to be lieutenant governor. Everybody's looking at that one, and that that may be where Pate winds up. Mm -hmm. That's where John Merrill's probably going to wind up. People forget about that. We just kind of forget about the lieutenant governor. Well, that's going to be the race. Twinkle Cavanaugh may be in there, and if she gets in there, she's a real. She's a tough candidate. I mean, so she may be in Lieutenant Governor's race. So it's going to be, Lieutenant Governor's race is going to field a lot of candidates the next time. And it'll start as soon as the polls close on November 5th. And it'll, it'll have an effect because it'll have an effect on what Tubbill's going to do. And, of course, uh, uh, I, when we talk about Ainsworth, he says he's, he's, he's still making a decision. I think the decision is he probably runs. There's no question that, that, that young Mr. Ainsworth wants to run for governor. However... Let me say this, that the, all three of those guys that I mentioned, Ainsworth, Marston, and Pate, only have about 20% name identification. Mm. People don't realize how low and hard it is to get name identification. Stoville has 75%, and I know he's made some faux pas or done some right-wing stuff, but he's popular. So he may run them out of that governor's race if he gets in there. Oh, I think it would probably be an interesting race if he did. Steve Flowers, <laughs> our political analyst. Uh, appreciate it so much, Steve. Thank awesome. You. We'll probably have you back after the election. I know you got a book. We'll talk about that the next time you're on the show that you're promoting. And uh, we'll have you back in November and see where the world stands then, if it didn't fall apart. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Steve. And we'll be right back here on Capital Journal. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online anytime at Alabama Public Television's website, aptv.org. Click on the online video tab on the main page. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. And welcome back to Capital Journal. I'm joined now by Representative Ed Oliver out of Dadeville. Appreciate so much joining us today. Thanks for being with us. Glad to be here. Let's talk about uh, the rural physician tax credit, something that I know you're championing right now, or an update to that credit. First of all, what is the rural physician tax credit, and how did it get on your radar? Well, we have an existing piece of legislation that's designed to recruit and retain physicians in rural areas. And what we're going to do is update it a little bit to compensate for inflation. Uh, we have a 1993 law that was intended to make the rural areas of Alabama a little more competitive for physicians. And face it, 1993 is a long time ago. Yeah. So we're going to increase the amount of the tax credit 
uh, and we're going to redefine the, or, or actually define the areas where it will, will fit. You mentioned 1993, 30-something years ago. Uh, the, the cost of being a physician has changed. Everything in life has changed. Oh, gosh. Just in the last couple of years with inflation it has really affected physicians across the state, I'm sure. Absolutely. Uh, inflation, reimbursements, there are just so many things that affect rural health. Uh, and as you're aware, hospitals are closing, doctors are moving out. I, I attended a meeting in my district of physicians two weeks ago and the, looked at the age around the room, mm -hmm. and there were not many of them there younger than I am, and I'm not exactly a spring chicken. Well, you should give yourself a little <laughs> so more credit. There you go. So you, the update, you said updating, so we're like $10,000 for four-year tax credit, uh, and the requirements for that are physicians, physicians to live and practice in rural communities, and it would sunset from what you have right now in 2020. Right, correct? right, it would sunset, and we thought that was important. Uh, under the current law, the existing credit is available to the licensed resident physician who practice in a particular area and reside in a small or rural Alabama community. Well, nobody defined that in the previous legislation. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're saying that uh, it's supposed to be with less than 25,000 residents and you have to have admission privileges to a smaller rural hospital. Well, as hospitals close, that makes no sense because mm -hmm. you're just encouraging those physicians to move out of those areas. So that's something we really wanted to change. A lot of hospitals earlier in the show, we ran a story on Jackson Hospital in Montgomery running into some financial troubles, and they're a larger hospital. They're, they're, but we've seen these rural communities, if you've talked about, these hospitals that just can't make it anymore and having to close down. We're seeing residents in these rural counties having to drive an hour, two hours away to get any type of medical care. Uh, th this is really designed, I'm sure, to really help get these doctors back into these rural communities. Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, there was a time when you went to medical school and you graduated and everybody sent you a credit card and they wanted you to be a member mm -hmm. of the country club and you built a huge mansion on a hill. Those days are over. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other states you can go and actually make way more money than you make in this state for various reasons. Uh, and like I said, it's reimbursement rates, inflation, uh, your payer mix, the, the folks who live here, what they can afford. I remember when I was, I lived in the, the city of Dothan when I first got out of college years and years ago. And at the time, the thought process was, well, we're seeing a lot of these doctors coming in, two big medical hospitals in Dothan uh, from California, these other states, because Alabama was a much more hospitable place for them to be. But as you have said, times have changed a lot. And it's just a really, it really has become a much more, I hate to say the word hostile, but it is a more challenging environment. Uh, much more challenging and that's why we felt like it was important to come up with this bill and what we want to do is we want to update it ten thousand mm -hmm. dollars a year over a, a four-year period and we think that would encourage people to to come and live and practice in a, a rural setting uh, I would like to add though that what we see uh, from a practical level is that the kids that come from a rural area are much more likely to go to med school and come back to where they grew up and that's the best way to get a, a rural physician. Second best is by offering a tax credit. People look at doctors, they look at lawyers, and of course everyone thinks every doctor makes a lot of money and every lawyer makes a lot of money. That's not, not, not the truth at all whatsoever. And, not anymore. And, and, and the cost of being a doctor, where you're looking at just what does it cost to go to medical school? And then you're looking at by the time you finish four years of regular college, medical school, your residencies, and, I can, and the list goes on, on and on. You're in your late 20s, early 30s, and uh, you've got a mountain of student debt. And you're right, some of these jobs I would imagine in these larger cities are much more attractive than it would be to come to these rural communities. What are these doctors telling you? What are these younger, you mentioned going into a room and all the doctors look your age, but what are these younger doctors telling you? Um, most of them are afraid of insurance. You know, OBGYN insurance, 46000 a year uh, for the doctor himself, then all your employees you have to insure. So these doctors are looking for a group to go in business with. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, the days of a doctor out there operating on his own as a family practitioner, just, they're just going away quickly. So how do we take this and enhance the quality of life? You know, looking at rural practices here, um, you mentioned you're from the Dadeville area. You can think of Tallahassee. Then we can kind of get back into Lee County a little bit. There's some smaller communities there. And, of course, Auburn's right there. Opelika is right there. But how does having these medical professionals there, having a doctor in your hometown, maybe having that hospital not close, how does that not just change the quality of life, but kind of help the economy of these towns? Uh, that's one of the pillars of your infrastructure is what you have to offer for medicine. 
if you don't have a hospital, if you don't have uh, all of the things that come with services with a hospital, then that is a handicap. Mm -hmm. The farther you have to drive, the more difficult it is. I, I live on Lake Martin, and as of COVID, the median house on Lake Martin is 1.4 million. But it's still hard to get people to commit to live in there if they are older and have health challenges because of the distance to definitive health care. Especially if there's an emergency. How long does it take the ambulance to get there? How long does it take to get from there to the hospital? And, and that is an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, Actually, in Tallapoosa County, we have an experimental program that's running right now that we got a grant from the legislature for, where we have a pickup truck with a paramedic who actually provides life-saving services because he never leaves. Mm -hmm. We only have two ambulances outside of the city of Alexander City to serve a, a one county there in Tallapoosa. So when you need the ambulance, it's gone. It's in Montgomery or Birmingham. So we have this one guy in his pickup truck and he sits in our most densely populated area which is nine miles or so south of Dadeville, and he responds to calls out in that area. You mentioned this legislation, getting it in, the session starts here in a few months. Uh, have you talked to some of your fellow lawmakers, kind of what, what's the, uh, the temperature you're reading? And I know it's early. Uh, who could be against this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> which is what I say about all my legislation. Uh, I think the temperature is good for this particular bill. Let, let, let's talk about inflation a little bit more. That, that's so important, and it's obviously a, a big topic among Americans. It's politically, it's a big topic with, with the elections coming up. But how has that inf affected the real income uh, of these doctors? You mentioned earlier insurance. You mentioned just the cost of doing business. Is it having more of a stranglehold than the average person may think? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I think health care in the state of Alabama is in trouble. Uh, I think that if uh, we could see a very rapid deterioration of what we have to offer in terms of health care if we don't figure out a way to, to wrestle it now. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the longer we wait to, to do something, the more difficult it becomes. You also serve, uh, you serve on the House Committee uh, for Military and Veterans Affairs, and there was a meeting this past week. And let's talk about traumatic brain injuries. We, we hear so much about that, especially in the last 20 years with the wars in Afghanistan and, 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 and Iraq. But uh, there's more to it than just people in the military. Talk about how that's become an important issue for well, you. I think we've always talked about PTSD, mm -hmm. post-traumatic uh, issues, and I think what we're realizing now is that the population at large, not just veterans, from head injuries, concussions that you may have had in the past, most people don't even know it. Mm -hmm. Things you did in football, things you did play in the front yard when you were small, uh, have a very significant impact on you as you grow older. Uh, several diseases uh, that even ALS might even be related, uh, but we're discovering a lot of things we just didn't know before. And many of those translate into personality uh, conflicts. And of course, uh, I'm on the Veteran Suicide Prevention Task Force, and that's one of the things that we have picked up on is that uh, uh, traumatic brain injuries seem to be a catalyst for that. There are catalysts for that, so how do you really convince people that it's something we need to take a serious look at, and how, as a legislator, can you help address that? Well, in, in my district, uh, two of our football teams have padded helmets for practice. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're, the truth is nobody has all the answers. Mm -hmm. We're just not that smart, but there are things that we can do, and one of the things is just being aware. And of course, if you show symptoms of something that's not normal, you don't just brush it off. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you try to figure it out. You and I have talked, we both had concussions. I remember when I was younger, I had a concussion and my father said, hey, just don't go to sleep for a few hours, you'll be fine. A lot's changed in that time. And we <laughs> well, know a lot more now than we used to do. Yeah, if you're still alive the next morning, you're good. <laughs> yeah, that's so. Uh, there's a lot going on, especially with this uh, rural position tax credit. I know it's gonna be a big priority for you coming up in this session. Uh, Representative Ann Oliver of Dadeville, appreciate your time today. Thank you for letting me be on. Absolutely, anytime, you know, you're welcome back. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. And Capital Journal, We'll be right back. Since 1997, Alabama Public Television has provided programs, services, and resources to child care professionals, teachers, and parents. Visit aptv.org slash education to learn more. And welcome back to Capital Journal. I'm joined now by State Health Officer, Dr. Scott Harris. Dr. Harris, appreciate your time so much. Thanks for having me, Jeff. So much going on, and I have a whole list of questions here. And uh, let's start out with something people may not think about when they think of the state 
health officer, and that's hurricane response. But that is something I know your office is heavily involved with. Sure. Um, so, so ADPH is very much uh, in the area of preparedness and resilience of communities. We respond to natural disasters like a number of other state agencies do. And with the recent hurricanes that have come through the southeast, we have responded by helping out our sister states that, that have needs. We, uh, in public health, have sent a, a team of nurses to North Carolina um, to uh, work in a shelter there to help take care of displaced uh, people, including people with medical needs there. They've actually been there about two weeks at this point. Um, a number of other states did the same thing, and you know, there's certainly been times in Alabama's history when other states have shared uh, public health resources with us. So it, it's something that we're very proud to do. I was really um, just uh, had such a great feeling about how our nurses stepped up and volunteered. We didn't have to send anyone on this trip. They, they, they were all volunteers. Mm -hmm. They were really willing to help. And so far, they, they've done a lot of great work there. And a unique uh, difference, we think of hurricanes, we think of the, the, the coastal communities, we think of storm surge. But when you get into these Carolina communities, I know parts of eastern Tennessee, and into, uh, 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 it, it's very different, very mountainous, very hilly. So I, I'm assuming it presented challenges for you all but just to have those people volunteers, you said, just is, is really impressive. Yeah, it, it really is. And we haven't responded uh, to a, a hurricane event in that type of territory mm -hmm. before. We have sent uh, teams before to areas that have had ice storms. I know um, several years ago in Kentucky, for example, there was a big ice storm there, you know, similar, you know, landscape perhaps. But, but transportation, you know, the logistics of, of just transporting people and equipment uh, to this area has really been a challenge, but our folks have really stepped up to do that. Well, let's switch gears now to something that's more traditional, what we think of when we think of your office. Uh, uh, we've all heard of the E. coli outbreak, or if you haven't, there's been one at McDonald's. Uh, looks like they said they may have traced it to some contaminated onions. Uh, the quarter pounder off the menu in a lot of states. Uh, has that affected Alabama? Yeah, uh, so far we've not been involved in that. Um, you know, we, we follow that very closely, of course. Uh, FDA keeps us surprised of those investigations. Um, it has mostly been concentrated in, in, in the Midwest and in the West. Um, but I, I think the public would be surprised to learn how often we are become aware of those situations. You know, contaminated mm -hmm. uh, food products in establishments like this is something that happens, you know, certainly weekly, maybe not quite daily, uh, but it's a very common thing. It's just that the scale of this one has really gotten everyone's attentions and when it's at a, you know, a popular fast food restaurant, you know, that grabs a lot of headlines. Uh, but it's unfortunately a pretty common event. Pretty common, as you mentioned, and I ha was reading in a, in a national uh, magazine that you know McDonald's has apparently one of the, m the most stringent guidelines when it comes to food safety. So if it can happen to a McDonald's, it, it can happen anywhere. Yeah, that, that, that's right. Um, the, the, again, the scale of, of you know the way food is, is harvested and transported and prepared, and particularly when you're talking about food items that aren't cooked. You know, in this case, as you said, it, it may be raw onions that are involved. So those, you know, I'm sure they attempt to wash them, but they're not cooked, you know, and so there's always going to be some risk with that. And when you have a single supplier that's, you know, feeding, if you will, thousands of people across mm -hmm. a dozen states, uh, you can see how something like that could happen. What does E. coli do in kind of basic terms? If, if I was to get E. coli, and I've heard this is a, a fairly strong strain of it, well, what happens to the human body? Yeah, so, so E. coli is a common germ that we actually all have uh, in our bodies. It lives in our, our bowel, and that's a normal thing. But there are certain strains of E. coli that uh, cause a very severe uh, diarrhea. They can cause a, a fever and problems with blood clotting. Um, it's particularly an issue uh, for children. Uh, if young kids get this, they can end up with, with kidney failure uh, or, or worse. Uh, you know, there can be fatalities. There's actually been one fatality uh, from this current E. coli outbreak that you mentioned in the U.S. Uh, so it, it's something that can be prevented completely by uh, handling food safely and cooking it you know, before eating. Uh, but it continues to, to crop up. It's, it's been around for a long time now. Uh, let's switch gears from E. coli and let's move to the bird flu. It's something that's been around for a long time now. Uh, what's the latest with that in the state? Yeah, so, so bird flu is really interesting. Um, you know, bird flu is just what it sounds like. It's a type of influenza that affects birds. Birds have always been able to transfer that uh, to uh, certain other animals occasionally. You know, birds fly all over the place and sometimes they land on a poultry farm, for example, and you end up with a poultry flock that gets infected. We've had that happen several times in Alabama over the past several years. Uh, rarely people will get infected with bird flu. It doesn't happen much, um, but it can be quite severe when they do. So what's happened in, in the past several months is that we are, for the first time in this country, seeing bird flu that's infecting dairy cattle. Um, so dairy cattle around the country, not in Alabama yet, but dairy cattle around the country have become infected with bird flu, and that puts the people who take care of those cows uh, at risk for bird flu as well. 
Um, bird flu has been detected in milk, although pasteurization, you know, seems to take care of that situation. Um, it, it's still felt to be a low risk for most people, mm -hmm. but just the fact that it's in these flocks of, uh, in these herds of cattle, I mean, that we've never seen before, it has really been the big story. So we're monitoring um, anyone who's exposed to it. Uh, if we have a patient, uh, someone who actually contracts bird flu, they have all mostly done well so far uh, when that's happened around the country. Again, we don't have those here in, in Alabama so far. Uh, but, you know, you never know. It, preparedness is what we do in public health. We're, we're monitoring it to see if something else could happen. And I guess it shows how viruses and sicknesses and germs or whatever you want to look at it from a medical standpoint. I'm obviously no doctor, but that they evolve over time, that they want to find a way to live. Yeah, that, that, that's right. You know, nature always wins those battles, right? They're, nature is smarter than we are. Um, but it, it just goes to show you that we always have to be prepared. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, went through the COVID pandemic. You know, we had the H1N1 epidemic, you know, uh, 15 years ago almost. Um, there's always something lurking out there. Um, there are too many things going on in nature, um, you know, for us to be uh, incautious. You know, we have, to, we have to be prepared. So we have a, a great team of professionals who monitor those things. There, there's, uh, for example, a, a virus that has recently caused an outbreak in Africa called the Marburg virus. Um, it's on a lot of radars because it sort of behaves like Ebola. Um, so far, it's confined to Africa, but our country now is monitoring people traveling from mm -hmm. that part of the world. They're being um, sent to certain airports, so they get health screenings. If, if someone travels from that part of the world to Alabama, then our teams are responsible for monitoring those people. There are all these things that go on behind the scenes like that just to make sure people stay safe and healthy. You mentioned COVID a few moments ago. You and I got to know each other a lot better during yeah. the COVID <laughs> pandemic when we were you were having weekly uh, uh, press conferences to kind of discuss the outbreak in the state. W where are we now with COVID? Uh, we, we had quite a, a lot of cases uh, uh, over the past few months, just like most of the country did. We, we were able to monitor COVID in some ways with, with wastewater uh, surveillance. Um, there, there's a method for sampling essentially sewage, mm -hmm. uh, and you can find if people are, are putting COVID virus into the sewage uh, because someone who's infected will shed that when they use the bathroom. So it's kind of a clever way to see what the COVID activity is, even if your hospitals aren't filling up or people aren't you know, going to get tested. So it's just an extra way of doing that. We've had a lot of cases. Um, most people do very well these days. You know, Most people have either been vaccinated or had COVID a few times or both, uh, like me. Um, and so that uh, affords you some protection, but it's still a, a, a big issue for people who are most vulnerable, you know, for people who are, are seniors who have chronic health problems. It, it still can be a, a really big deal. Is it still like the flu recommending getting the booster shot each year? Yeah, so, so there are new recommendations. There's a new uh, vaccine that has just come out this fall. Um, it, it's not certain that it's going to be an annual recommendation. Mm -hmm. It could be uh, more often or less often. I think they're still trying to determine that. But there is an updated vaccine, and you should talk to your doctor to see if you're a candidate for that. Let's talk about whooping cough, which is, I always have a hard time saying whooping cough or whooping cough. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and you and I were talking earlier, I even spelled it wrong. It's, uh, it's something that's been around for a long, long time. Uh, a recent outbreak here in Alabama or some cases. Yeah, so, so it's actually happened around the country and, and not only here in Alabama. So, so whooping cough is how I learned to say it. Whooping cough. It does have a W, but uh, I guess it must be silent. Um, whooping cough, or, or sometimes uh, people know the name pertussis is the, is the medical mm -hmm. term for that, uh, is a of, uh, a disease that causes an infection of the airways and causes severe cough. Um, it's something that's really, really um, annoying and can put you put you down for a while if you're an adult. But if you're if you're a, a, an infant, a, a child that has these very tiny airways, uh, you know they're just physically small. Um, then whooping cough can actually be a fatal illness. Uh, and so uh, vaccination has been the way we've stopped this in this country for many many years. Uh, but there's been declining vaccination rates mm -hmm. uh, since the pandemic, particularly. And so we're beginning to see outbreaks. There's a, there's a big outbreak in the Montgomery region here, but certainly not the only one. Um, there are other outbreaks around the state, and in fact around the country, we have higher numbers of cases than we've seen in many years right now. Is that for adults as well, children? What, what do we mostly see that in? Yeah, so so most of the cases actually do uh, occur uh, in um, 
adolescents, because the, the vaccine has a sort of a limited uh, time of effectiveness, um, you, you need a vaccine at least every 10 years for whooping cough. Uh, and so by the time kids get into middle school or high school or maybe start going to college, it may have been a decade or so since they got those childhood shots to go to school. So that, that's when it starts showing up. It's also uh, common in uh, people who are grandparent age. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know now if you have a new grandchild, uh, many times you get warned by your uh, child's pediatrician, you can't come hold this baby until you go update your pertussis shot, your whooping cough shot. Uh, that's happened to me. Uh, yeah, I, so I don't want to give our ages away, but yeah. we're both in that grandparent yeah, age yeah. range. I mean, it is, uh, and I haven't had a vaccine in, in it's been more than 10 years, I yeah, can tell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, when you get the grandchild, they're not going to let you in the hospital to visit unless you get your whooping cough vaccine. So. Yeah, it's something you learn. And, and just a remaining moment or two here, t talk about the Department of Public Health. I mean, you all have such a broad mission, but on a daily basis, you've mentioned a few things here as far as kind of like making sure you really are the guardians of the gate almost, it seems like, as far as the health of the state. Yeah, yeah. We, we really work behind the scenes mostly. Um, you, you know, someone told me when I was coming into public health, um, you don't know it, but public health saved your life today. Uh, and I've learned that's really true. You know, the, the work that men and women do in public health to make sure that our food's safe, our water's safe to drink, that, you know, when you flush your toilet, um, sanitation is taken <laughs> care of so you're not exposed to something. Uh, they, they do so many things to make sure that um, people can live their best lives, that they can be safe and healthy, and that's really what we want. State Health Officer Dr. Scott Harris, we always appreciate your time. I always learn something new every time you come on the show, and we appreciate it so much. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Thank you. And we'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online anytime at Alabama Public Television's website, aptv.org. Click on the online video tab on the main page. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. And that wraps up our show for this week. Todd Stacy will be back in the anchor chair next week as we break down the latest from the state capitol and headlines from across Alabama. For all of us here at Capitol Journal, I'm Jeff Sanders. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again next week.